Hello and welcome to another episode of Stupid History Podcast. I'm your host, Tintin. Today, we will talk about an incident that is not stupid per se, but instead, it's kind of petty. This is a story from the 1790s of Lord Cornwallis, the British East India Company, and their love-hate relationship with George Washington and the first American ambassador to Calcutta, Benjamin Joy. Our story starts in 1781, in a place called Yorktown, on the east coast of the United States. In October that year, Yorktown was the venue of the decisive battle in the American War of Independence. General Lord Cornwallis found his British redcoats completely surrounded by the American rebel army led by General George Washington. Cornwallis had no escape route. The sea behind him was teeming with the French Royal Fleet, commanded by Count Rochambeau. On 17th October 1781, after a week-long siege, Cornwallis' resolve broke, and he decided to surrender. At the surrender ceremony two days later, Cornwallis failed to show up. He complained of illness and sent his sword with his deputy, General O'Hara. Now, Washington saw through Cornwallis's lie and did not accept the sword himself. Instead, he asked his own deputy, General Benjamin Lincoln, to accept it. Thus began an ego battle between Washington and Cornwallis that would have repercussions 16,000 miles away in Calcutta in the 1790s. Fast forward to 1786. Lord Cornwallis is now the Governor General of the East India Company's territories in South Asia. In his current posting, he lives in Calcutta, the East India Company's capital in South and Southeast Asia. As the Governor General, Cornwallis' job was to consolidate and expand the company's territories. He was also in charge of expanding the East India Company's trade to make money for its shareholders back in England. Cornwallis realized that the new nation of the United States of America could be a potential competitor of the East India Company in trade in South Asia. So, while he declared that American traders were like siblings to the British, their commercial ships were welcome to East India Company's territories, he made sure that the company got to decide what the Americans could trade in. Ships from the United States did not wait for this cautious overture by Cornwallis, though. In 1784, that is two years before Cornwallis even arrived in India, the first U.S. ship flying the Star Spangled Banner and the flag of Philadelphia had arrived at the French port of Pondicherry in South India. A year later, another ship called Hydra arrived at the French port of Chondonagor on the Hooghly River in Bengal. But it was only after Cornwallis made his declaration welcoming American ships to the British East India Company's ports that U.S. trade with India really started picking up. The first American ship docked in Calcutta's port in 1787, that is, a year after Cornwallis arrived as the Governor General in India. With the help of their local procuring agents like Ramdulal Deh and the Mitras of Dorjipara, the ship returned to Boston with bales and bales of Bengal handloom fabric. The trade between Boston and Calcutta was so lucrative that when the US Senate decided to set up consulates all around the world in 1790, the Boston merchants and investors petitioned the senator from Massachusetts to lobby to set up a US consulate in Calcutta. This would be their first ever consulate in Asia. They also nominated a 37-year-old Boston merchant named Benjamin Joy as their first consul to India. On 7th November 1792, President George Washington approved Joy's appointment as the first American consul in Calcutta and in all of South Asia. His formal title was the Consul of the United States at Calcutta and other ports and places on the coast of India and Asia. Now that was a very wide and a very ambiguous jurisdiction and it showed how little Americans knew about Calcutta and India at that time. Benjamin Joy was selected 
because he already had substantial experience in trading with Bengal, both through the years of American War of Independence and even earlier than that. During the War of Independence, Joy had been a loyalist, one of the Americans who supported the continuation of British rule in America. As a result, he traded under the British flag and had no problem accessing Calcutta and other British East India Company held ports in India. But now, nine years later, after the US had become an independent nation, he would have to meet and find ways to work with George Washington's old adversary, Lord Cornwallis, in Calcutta as an American, upholding the American flag and his new country's interests. President Washington and the Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson had already written to their old enemy, Lord Cornwallis, in friendship. They informed him of Joy's appointment to Calcutta. Cornwallis, in his immense, pompous pettiness, ignored their letters and pretended that the letters had not arrived to him. Joy's arrival in Calcutta was delayed by a year and a half, as the French Revolution had already broken out, leading to naval skirmishes between the British, Dutch, and the French Revolutionary Fleet in the Atlantic. When Joy finally arrived in Calcutta in 1794, he found that Cornwallis had already left. He would now have to deal with a new Governor-General, the timid and indecisive Sir John Shore. Sir John Shore followed every word of every instruction he had received from his superiors, and also his predecessor, Cornwallis, who had groomed him well before he left. If Joy was relieved about avoiding an uncomfortable meeting with Cornwallis, this relief was soon proved mistaken. Before he left, Cornwallis had already told Sir John Shore about the appointment of Joy, and he had given him some ideas about how to deal with these upstart Americans. Based on this advice, Shore made sure to create barriers to prevent Benjamin Joy from functioning smoothly as the US consul to Calcutta. Sir John Shore made sure that Benjamin Joy fails in upholding US political and commercial interests in India under his watch. For starters, the ship carrying Joy was not given the customary nine-gun salute from Fort William. That was an honor reserved for the consul generals. Then, Shore refused to formally receive him with full honors over a state dinner. When he met him unofficially at the Governor General's residence, Joy was bluntly told that the East India Company did not recognize him as an official U.S. consul to India. Shore told him that he could stay in Calcutta as long as he wants, but he has to stay as a U.S. commercial agent. Shore also made it clear that Joy will not receive any consul privileges from the East India Company, like an official residence or even diplomatic immunity. That was a subtle threat from his side. Benjamin Joy was stunned by this cold reception. He wrote to his superiors about what went on, but they were 16,000 miles away, so he had to wait for their instructions. As he waited, he tried to find out what his government could do to make the East India Company recognize him as the U.S. Consul General in India. Here too, Sir John Shore blankly told him that the company, despite being the rulers of territories in South Asia, had no legal right to accept or recognize diplomats from other countries. He suggested that Washington write to King George III directly to recognize Joy's position as consul. Or, John Shore said, there was another way. He made Joy believe that the East India Company was just a business entity. According to this account, the company held power in India at the pleasure of the Mughal Emperor in Delhi. So Joy and his superiors should send letters directly to the Mughal Emperor. If the Emperor gave his blessings, the company would not have any qualms in accepting Joy as the American consul in India. Now, if you know anything about the British colonial history at this time, you already know that all of this was bullshit. The Mughal emperor at this time, Shah Alam II, did not hold any real power. He did not have much influence. He did not have much territory either. While the East India Company was technically still paying taxes to him, 
Their law and their control was paramount on the territories that they controlled. This was just a delaying tactic, and this was just a tactic to make life difficult for Benjamin Joy. Joy was so frustrated by this diplomatic quagmire that he sent letter after letter to the U.S. Senate and to George Washington's cabinet. He vented his anger and frustration on them. By 1796, he had had enough. Enough of trying and enough of failing to work with the company's authorities in Calcutta. As a result, in January 1796, Benjamin Joy resigned his post and returned to Boston. The U.S. Senate would appoint two subsequent consuls to Calcutta, but neither of them left the U.S. after hearing these horror stories. It was only after 47 long years in 1843 that James B. Higginson becomes the second U.S. consul to arrive and take up his post in Calcutta, this time with full recognition from the East India Company. But Benjamin Joy's pioneering diplomatic adventure in South Asia was not forgotten. In 2016, the U.S. State and Commerce Departments instituted a joint Benjamin Joy Award to recognize interagency collaboration and commercial diplomacy excellence among the U.S. diplomatic missions worldwide. Hey everyone, thank you very much indeed for tuning in. Do let me know what you thought about this episode. Subscribe to the Stupid History Podcast on Spotify or Podbean. You can also follow the Facebook page and YouTube channel of Heritage Walk Calcutta to listen to more such podcasts. To support our research at this trying time of a global pandemic, please make a donation on patreon.com forward slash heritagewalkcal. That is patreon.com forward slash heritagewalkcal. C-A-L. Thank you, stay home, stay safe, and keep smiling. I will see you next week.